you are live. And I forgot to press the other button. Sorry, guys. Here we go. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the show. It's another great episode of the V Door Locksmith. I am your host, David Gibson, where we are unlocking the secrets to success one interview at a time. Uh, I am really excited about today's show just because, well, today is Friday and actually feels like a Friday for once for me and not just like a blend of all the other days together. So, uh, first and foremost, as per normal, guys, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, Throw it out here in the comment section. I'm going to see if I can get this thing working here. Um, and would love to be able to give you guys a shout out. So, uh, Stephen Hayes watching from Tomball, Texas. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chris in the Delaware desert. Uh, Abbas from Iraq. What time is it there? Wow. A couple of other guys there in the Middle East. I saw him in uh, Saudi. Rolf from London. Rolf was uh, Rolf watched the show last week. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, oh, David Reed. Ooh, wow. Even David Reed's watching the show. He's the chief technology officer, chief marketing officer over at NOV. You guys, uh, be sure to hit him up. Uh, he's got some really cool stuff coming up with the Red M project. So, guys, stay tuned to some of the stuff that David's putting out. Very important. Uh, oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. So, we've got uh, Patty Murphy. We're here to change his mind today. Uh, somebody from India. Well, wow, they're coming in so fast. As always, uh, Lee House, who's tuning in. Lee, thanks uh, for the support, as always, sir. Uh, Duncan Blue from Cypress, Texas. Uh, Devonsh from India. Thank you, guys. This is awesome. Uh, Vasily from Aberdeen. Barry. it's my homeboy right there. Barry, thanks for tuning in, bud. Um, I see you. Oh, wait. Where was that? I just saw it. Hold on. There was somebody I wanted to make sure that I give him a special shout out to Aaron Dowdy. Aaron, as always, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Where did the other one go? There we go. Bob Godbolt. Bob, thank you. I do appreciate it. So uh, we're just gonna, I'll, I'll just click a whole bunch of these because I can't click them and read them at the same time. I appreciate all the people that that are watching. I just happen to have some that, that caught my eye. Uh, Jenny Wilson, thank you. John DeWart, thank you. LinkedIn user, whoever that is, we appreciate you. We really do. Thank you. Um, oh, me. Thank you, David, for being here. No, okay, that was silly. All right, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. This is going to be an awesome uh, hello from Mars. Somebody's in the SpaceX program. Cool. 
Red M. Oh, I was about to click on it and then it moved. There we go. David Reed said Red M the movement. So guys, if you have it already, send a connection request or just follow. You don't have to send the connection request. You can also follow people on LinkedIn. Follow David. He's very active on LinkedIn and will respond. Also, be sure to check out the NOV live broadcast. Those are really good stuff. I've been put out some really great information. I'm not really trying to support or they're not paying me for this or anything, but like I like other people who do the live broadcast and the, uh, the team over at NOV, uh, Michael Gates, David Reed, uh, the Ask Aside show. There's some really interesting stuff that they put together um, and they're really trying to push the envelope and, and they have got a you know, great leadership team there doing some really cool stuff. So highly recommend it. Uh, said from a Ramco LinkedIn user. <laughs> uh troy thanks for tuning in and then joseph there in the woodlands yeah i'm pretty sure we got tons of people watching in the uh houston woodlands texas area guys thanks so much all right um i have to do something real quick because yesterday yesterday evening i made a post uh and some people thought it was fake so to be able to show that it's not fake here's one of the cookies that i made this is one of many they're quite delicious but if you could see that it says gibson reports on there and then on the back side it's got my logo these are real it makes for a really good video to be like eating stuff oh my god it's doing something you ever watch cooking shows when they eat something they usually go to another picture or there's a co-host at that point in time there's other people so you're not just like eating and talking to the audience but Oh, that's really good. I want to take a second bite, but I already explained to you why eating on camera is bad. So check the beard. Beard's good. Okay. No food in the beard. Um, guys, I'm going to ask you one quick favor. Instead of trying to help me drum up some sponsorship stuff, we tried this thing where we tagged a company. And I'm not even going to mention who they are in the comment section. We're not going to do that this time. What we'll do, I just want you to tag a friend. Bring a friend to the show. That's what the whole new thing is going to be. Just bring a friend to the show. Tag somebody else who you think could gain some insight or or better position themselves in the industry by understanding the talk and conversation that we're going to have today with Mark Anderson, who's an amazing person. We're going to be talking about, uh, I, I don't even like saying automation just because I think that's that's a... With what he explains, you'll understand why that's not even a good word to describe what's going to happen in the show today. Mark's an absolutely amazing person. He's a very, very funny individual. He's been uh, very involved with the SPE DSETS group. Uh, so if you haven't, also go check that out. Uh, myself, Mark, and Honey Ibrahim from HP Technologies, we run the company page. And we're always posting whatever webinars or information is coming up so that people can uh, stay on top of any of the online stuff. So... John DeWart says, show us the back of your head. There is no logo in the back of my head today. It's only on the cookies. Um, and Lisa, I bet the, the twins are the, the twins are, are at family house, so they haven't gotten to see, see these yet. They've only gotten pictures, so they are not eating any of them yet. So, all right, let's do a quick commercial break. Uh, and before we do, I should say this. If your company is interested in doing a How It's Done video, get in touch with me. We are looking for uh, companies that want to do be a part of season two. And season two is going to be longer than 10 episodes. We may push it to 15 or 20 episodes. So if you want to be a part of that series, get in touch with you. If you haven't seen the How It's Done series, all the videos are on YouTube. All the videos are on LinkedIn. They're probably easier to find on YouTube because that's an actual video platform and LinkedIn is not. I don't like to push people off of any one platform, but that's the best way to be able to watch them. So uh without further ado let's do the commercial for how it's done and we'll be right back So I took another bite of my cookie real quick. So without further ado, Mark, thank you for joining the show today. Second time on the show. So happy to have you here. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? 
Oh. Yes, I can. There was a little bit of a delay there, but yeah, it's working. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. So okay. give us a quick introduction of what we are going to be talking about today. Okay, sure. We're going to be talking about uh, drilling automation, drilling digitalization. And what I'd like to do is set up a brief short course, if you will, talking about automation and digitalization in the broad terms and then talk about specifically to drilling. All right, guys, there it is. So uh, before we we jump on, we go too much further. Like if you guys, if you have not, um, when we get done here, don't do it right now. Send a connection request to, to Mark. If you haven't connected with me, do do the same. Follow the, the hashtag Vidor Locksmith so that way you guys can stay up to date with some of the stuff we're doing here on LinkedIn. Um, the other thing is, is that if you guys have questions during today's show, be sure to throw them out there. We've already kind of picked out kind of a stopping point. We'll get done with the first portion of the PowerPoint presentation. And so Mark's actually got a slide in there that'll show you that. Uh, so you'll know kind of where we're at as far as um, when the time is to be able to ask questions. You guys can keep asking them. Um, I'll say this, most of the time, a lot of the questions get answered in the comment section. We do have another expert in the comment section or in the audience today with John DeWart. So I know that he'll he'll be able to answer tons of questions. He's been you know, one of the pioneering members of the DSATS group as well. He can probably correct me and I know that I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, so feel free to throw out your questions. We'll, we'll keep everything running. Like I said, please, if you can just tag one fr friend in the audience today, uh, let's get this, the show, let's shoot for the goal of 250 people watching in real time, make this the, the the biggest show we've ever done. So uh, please do share, um, let us know. And then let's see here. So we will say hi to Roy Strand. Uh, he just had a, a new little uh, human that he added to his gang. So congratulations there, Roy. Uh, Emilio for watching from Bogota, Colombia. My old business partner, Abel Moreno. Thanks, Abel, for watching. Uh, Mulat from Russia. Wow, I love seeing everybody watching from all over. Uh, and Martin watching from Singapore. It is a very late night there. And then the ever present Brian Dugas, Cookie Monster. Me love Cookie. Thanks, man, so much. All right, Mark, it is all yours. Let me go ahead and add your presentation to the screen. It's nice, it's big. If you guys have any questions, be sure to throw them out there. We'll get everything rolling right along. Mark, the show is yours, sir. Okay, okay, great. And uh, David, because I can't see the, the camera and there's no audience feedback, jump in if i'm going too slow going too fast if something else is going on please. if 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 there is a monster behind you i will jump in and let you know okay i've got your back sir okay well there we go so uh so so i so i'm mark anderson um and what what i was asked to do was to do a sort of like a quick survey course but as i was doing this you know, I wasn't going to be able to give you guys homework or an exam. So it actually felt a little, little bit more like a presentation. So so here we go. Let me introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Mark Anderson. Um, I had 37 years with Shell until about 18 months ago. My last position in Shell was general manager of drilling mechanics technologies. I chair the SPE drilling systems automation technical section. Uh, I started off in New Orleans in uh, 1981. I went to uh, to uh, Rio, to Lisbon, spent three years in Damascus, six years in Aberdeen, four years in Gabon. Uh, the the, uh, the first uh, New Orleans through uh, Aberdeen, I was in drilling. Uh, in Gabon, I became, uh, as a drilling engineer, in Gabon, I became a rig superintendent. Uh, and then I got moved to Ryswijk, which is a suburb of The Hague in the Netherlands. And uh, I went into the technology section there, the, the EP labs there. About I, 16 or so years ago, I moved here to Houston, where I still live. Um, and there's a picture of me over on the right. Uh, that's about six weeks after I joined Shell in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I was really proud of uh, working for Shell then, and I'm really proud of my uh, my career. I had a, a fabulous career with Shell. So what I'd like to do is really try to address the question, can drilling be automated? And what I'm gonna do is talk about some uh, useful resources, then go into some theory of automation. 
uh, talk about myth busting, talk about some definitions and some useful concepts. And I'm gonna to try to use as an analogy to drilling, barbecue cooking and feral hog trapping. And then I'm gonna have just a couple of slides on the social implications of automation. Uh, then we're gonna take a break and then uh, we'll go into part two, which is talking about automation and digitalization and drilling. And then one slide at the end talking about, well, where is this all going? And, and for Q&A, I mean, I can just talk and talk and talk and talk some more. Uh, please uh, send your, your, your questions in to, uh, to David and he can interrupt me at appropriate times to, to sort of keep this lively. So it's just not a, a, a long monologue. So on the question of can drilling be automated, I'm going to, uh, to give you a spoiler alert for the, next, uh, for the next part of the presentation. It is not an if question, but it's a what, when, why, and to what level can we automate drilling type question. And so that's what I'm gonna to try to go to. Some useful resources. Uh, and this is uh, in the LinkedIn post that uh, David sent out last night. Uh, the IADC is a great resource and the IADC Arts Committee, uh, Advanced Rig Technology Committee is uh, another, uh, in particular, a great resource. Uh, SPE, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, or in some places it's being rebranded as the Society of Professionals in Engineering, uh, has a uh, uh, has a great number of resources, and uh, because of COVID, there's much more online content that's available to the general public. It's uh, really an exciting days for uh, SPE at this time. So there's a drilling systems automation technical section. There's a drilling uncertainty prediction technical section, and then there's the industrial steering group on wellbore survey accuracy. Uh, and all those have, uh, have resources available. Drillbotics is the SPE student competition where students uh, get together and they build a small drilling rig. And that is a tremendously exciting program, really expanding tremendously. And then I would uh, ask for the non-SPE members and uh, SPE members to look for the MIT, Members in Transition. So if you ever see that, their discounts or much of the programs are provided free. So if you've, uh, if you've lost your job or your income has become impaired, uh, SBE is, uh, is, is uh, making, uh, uh, making it uh, available to you for a, a deep discount or, or for free. Some useful references is the Drilling Systems Automation Roadmap. Uh, John DeWart was mentioned earlier. He did a magnificent job in leading an effort to uh, put together a, uh, a document. I think it's about 350 pages. I haven't counted. Uh, and that has a roadmap of how drilling can be automated. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively technical, but it is a great resource. So that's there. The Drilling Systems Automation Body of Knowledge is another resource out there on the web uh, that has uh, links to the roadmap, plus it has other resources. So at some point I'm gonna get into ISA 88, the batch control standard, and there's a very good uh, summary of the batch control system uh, from the PLC Academy, the links there. Other useful references, there are, there are lots of uh, SB and IEDC webinars, and the nice thing is these are recorded, so you can go back and watch them uh, at your own free time. And there's lots of online courses. One, one uh, person I follow is uh, John, who I met when he was uh, doing, uh, when he was working at uh, ExxonMobil. Uh, he's now a, a, a Brigham Young University associate professor and uh, he has started uh, uh, doing little courses on how to do Java, how to do Python. He's gonna start one on how to do MATLAB. And, and these are really nice, simple little courses that you at whatever level of programming you are can just get on and play with, with them for a half an hour, an hour, and then start to get some sort of familiarity with that. Not that you're gonna be an excellent programmer, but if you ever get into a situation where you are having to, to deal with programs or 
things in development, you'll be able to understand a little bit more about where that programmer is and where he's coming from, and that makes a better team. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, background theory definitions, and hopefully I'll do some myth busting. And the first one is a, a myth buster, and that is that drilling automation is new. Well, it's not. The first patent I could find for drilling automation was from Westinghouse in 1932. Uh, Shell jumped into the game in 1942 with its first patent for a drilling weight control system. And it sort of kept on going at a very slow place until the mid 60s. And then you see, you saw a flurry of patents in drilling automation because of electronics. So electronics was really a game changer in terms of drilling automation. So we've been at drilling automation, what's that, you know, like uh, 90 years, uh, 80 years. Um, so, so, you know, drilling automation is not new. Let's start off some, with some basic definitions. And so I'll ask uh, this question. Is this steam turbine a picture of what you would consider technology? I think everyone on the call would say, yes, this looks like technology. But then are these technologies some Neolithic uh, artifacts, uh, uh, a wheel from 6,000 years ago, and, and in this case, a gorilla using a branch to gauge the water depth. So are those technologies? Well, the definition of technology, if you look in the dictionary, is science or knowledge put to practical use to solve problems or invent new tools. It doesn't mention new or expensive. So under this definition, all those examples you just saw are indeed technology. We use technology to drill oil wells right now. Absolutely, we do. So here's another one. Is this a picture of automation? It's the auto self-driving truck. Its first delivery was 5,000 beers. I can't think of a better, more valuable payload than beer. Uh, it first drove on the, uh, on the uh, US uh, highways in August, 2016. And it drove from Fort Clowns to Colorado Springs with no one behind the wheel. Uh, it also had a police car uh, in front of it and behind it with, with, uh, with the lights going to make sure that, you know, nothing really bad happened. But you, you get the picture. Okay, well, I think that we can all agree that this is automation. Well, let's look at another vehicle. In this case, a 1913 Cadillac. And the choke and the ignition advance and retard is on the steering wheel. So as you increase the RPMs of an engine, you have to change the timing of, of, of the spark. That's the uh, ignition advance and retard. And in 1913, Cadillac did a great uh, uh, innovation and they moved the, 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 the retarder up to the steering wheel. Now is this automation? Well, let's look at the definition of automation. Automation is the use of a control system and information technologies to reduce the need for human intervention. In the scope uh, of industrialization, automation is a step beyond mechanization, where mechanization provides human operators with machinery to assist them with muscular requirements of work. Automation greatly reduces the needs for human sensory and mental requirements as well. So under this definition, that 1913 uh, Cadillac was not automation, it was mechanization because you help the human operator with the work he was doing by, by mechanical means. Now note that this definition has changed over time. Back in 1913, that new Cadillac was certainly automation. And when I think forward another 100 years, that definition of what automation will have changed again. But this is our current definition of automations and, and also mechanization, uh, mechanization. So we have, we have uh, uh, automation, autonomous, 
robotics, and megatronics. So four different terms. So let's try to define these. We just defined automation. Autonomy is, uh, is uh, a, a state of equipment that can perform operations without human input or guidance. A robot is a machine, especially programmed by a computer, capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. I find autonomous and robots are a subset of automation, and they're not particularly useful from an engineering perspective. The term I like better is megatronics. So megatronics is a multidisciplinary branch of engineering that focuses on electrical and mechanical systems and includes a combination of robots, electronics, computers, telecommunications systems, protocols, and product engineering. That, that's a mouthful and it sort of contains everything. If I was going to university uh, again, I would not major in mechanical engineering. I would, I would be into megatronics because I think that this is really where the future is going to be is a blending of the different disciplines. Okay, so far so good. So I'd like to talk about sensors and we have analog and digital sensors. And now all sensors are, are analog. The output of some sensors are digital. And I have three uh, that I just found uh, in my home. Uh, I have an analog uh, temperature sensor on the left. I have a digital tem tem temperature sensor in the middle, but that's not connected to anything except the, the little screen there. And then I have a uh, 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 temperature thermometer there that's connected to Bluetooth. And the one on the right is really the game changer as it is in industry. And and because it's connect it's digitally connected to other things, you can connect that to data historians. Uh, remote capabilities and or control systems. In this case, the thermometer on the right is connected to a Bluetooth app uh, on my on my uh, 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 on my on my uh, on my uh, on my iPhone. So I can check wherever I may be and with a temperature that's uh, that's cooking. And, and and that brings us into remote monitoring and remote uh, control. Um, so, so here we are with our neighbors. Uh, he has uh, lymphoma and it's undergoing chemotherapy. So we are social distancing, but we've increased our social dis distancing up to about 20 feet because he is really in a uh, critical uh, state. And uh, he is, he is uh, a remote monitoring center with his barbecue and his iPhone. And, and he can do uh, two things. He looks at his, uh, he looks at his, uh, his online uh, data and and he says, "Honey, I just checked the meat thermometer app on my iPhone, and the meat's cooking fast. You better get the salad ready." So he's doing remote monitoring. He's remote from the barbecue. Uh, on the other side, it's, uh, "Honey, I just checked the meat thermometer app on my iPhone, and it's cooking fast. I will turn down the temperature on the grill uh, from my iPhone app because I have an iPhone app that controls the temperature in the grill as well." Uh, while you make the salad. So here he's doing remote control. Uh, we think we think nothing of this in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, there seems to be some controversy about this uh, uh, in the oil field, but we'll get to that later. Then we have another thing, uh, which is edge computing, and that's versus cloud computing or on-premises type computing. So an edge computing uh, is a device that sits with the, the operations on the drilling rig. And then because we have digital data, we can stream that and we can stream it to an office data server on premises computing, or we can stream that to the cloud, or we can stream that to both. And then we can pull data back into our edge computing from a data center or a cloud. I, I think it's largely irrelevant whether you're streaming to a to a to on-premises data center or to the cloud. But the cloud is really a game changer when it comes to startups, because now a startup can uh, jump in and start to program without the need to purchase servers and without all the costs of the infrastructure. 
So uh, a startup can just start a, uh, a subscription with AWS or Azure, and they can start to program 30 minutes after they start the company. They, they, they really don't have to wait and they don't have to have the capital. So the number, the proliferation of people that are able to, to, you, to get in and start to program in the space has just increased because the barrier to entry has just, uh, just uh, lowered. And then this this brings me on to to what is in uh, what is real time, and I hope to make a fairly controversial statement here. And that in the context of automation, real time data is data from the sensor before it hits a data historian, before it hits a, a, a database, and that's data on the black plane of a PLC. Uh, any data that's pulled from a database is no longer real time. The key concept is not real time, but it's in latency. So if you're sitting in a data center and you think you're looking at real time data, you're not. There is some sort of latency from the sensor recording something to the time you get it. If that latency is too large, then maybe you have a problem. If that latency is small, then you might not have a problem, but it's not real time. And, and what really is, uh, is, is just um, uh, mind boggling from, from my point of view. So I started 40 years ago and the technical capabilities we had at university, we thought were amazing and they're nothing compared to what we have now. The cost of the sensors are just rapidly declining. The cost of computing is rapidly uh, declining and the capability of computing is 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 so much more than than uh, than than we had before. So right in front of me, I have an iPhone, I have an iPad, I have my MacBook Pro. I'm I'm on the 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 internet that goes up to the cloud. And I'm broadcasting to people all over the world. For forty years ago, for when I graduated, for me to do the same sort of thing, well, that would be a tremendously expensive uh, operation. And uh, there's a myth that right where we are is as good as it's going to get. No, the technical capabilities and the costs are going to continue to decline. And so we're going to become, we're going to get more and more capable with computing and digitalization. So we have manual, so we can turn the spit with our, with our, with, 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 our, uh, with our, with our arm. We mechanize, we can put a motor on the spit. Or we can automate. We can we can set up the grill with an automated uh, uh, auger that controls the temperature inside there, and with fans, so we can set the temperature very precisely. But if we look at an industrial process, in this case, chickens for Costco, that will, uh, when you go to buy a, a rotisserie chicken from Costco, this is what the this is what the factory looks like. Uh, it's not so neatly manual, mechanized, or automated. It's sort of it's sort of all jumped in there together. So what you have to do is you have to look down at the detail level, and then it becomes more clear. And uh, starting in 1951, Fitz uh, started to look at uh, uh, um, uh, some sort of thinking about that. Men are better at and machines are better at to try to figure out what we wanted the machines to do and what humans were still able to do the the mamba mamba uh, and uh, so uh, men are better at uh, uh, improvising and using flexible procedures exercising judgment where machines are much better at responding quickly to control signals uh, uh, storing information briefly and then erasing it completely that sort of thing so you know so what to what machines and what men can do well this has been a debate that's been going on for for quite a long time the sweet spot for and uh for automation turns out to be the three d's dirty dull or dangerous tasks those are what you want to automate and I'll throw in two more things. You want them to be repetitive and standardized. So if you're gonna do something that's dirty, 
in a repetitive manner and have it a standardized procedure, then that's really what you want to try to shoot for automation. So let's uh, now jump over to decision making. Uh, Sheridan and Verplank in 1978 uh, offered us a, uh, a hierarchy of decision makings where at the low level, the, uh, the human just does everything himself. And at the highest level, it's a computer decides everything and ignores a human. And in between, you have all these different layers. So uh, number five, uh, the computer suggests an action uh, for the human, and then the human can approve that action or not. Level six is the computer allows uh, uh, suggests an action, and the human's given a restricted amount of time, say 15 seconds, to veto that action. And then level seven, the automation uh, uh, executes that action and then informs the human. You know, level eight, he, uh, the computer informs a human only if asked. So, so you have a nice narrative of, of, of a decision making in different steps going from a low level to a high level. And this comes from the DSA roadmap that I mentioned previously. The, the, uh, the uh, European Sky Initiative uh, came up with uh, an improvement to that. And they've sequenced up an, uh, uh, a decision making task into the low to high that you see on the, the, the Y axis, but on the X, one is information acquisition, information analysis, decision and action selection, and then action implementation. So there are four parts you need to have uh, to make a decision. You have to acquire the information, you have to an analyze that information, you have to make a decision, then you have to, to action that decision. And levels from completely manual to completely automated. And this is sort of esoteric. Uh, so I'll try to give an example that many, that I hope you can uh, relate to. And this is uh, feral hog trapping. So uh, feral hog trapping is actually a pretty uh, important uh, issue. Uh, we lose about $2 billion a year uh, in the United States to feral hogs. So trapping it is, uh, it is a valuable and an important task. The equipment here is a, a boar buster trap with a one button trap deployment. So the action is, is automated with one button. But the key decision is really, when do you want to, to press that button? When do you want to activate the trap to get the maximum number of wild boars? So we can, we can plot this. Uh, and uh, in exercise one, I want you to picture that the way that we're going to activate the trap is we're going to put a man in a blind, and he's going to sit there for 24 hours a day, and he's going to watch the trap. And when there are an appropriate number of hogs under the trap, he's going to press a button. So how would you put uh, put your uh, how would you rate that? Well, the Information acquisition is manual. The guy's just looking at it. The information analysis is manual. He has to figure out himself. The action selection, he decides when he's going to press a button. And then once he presses a button, the trap does a rest. That's fully automated. Well, there's another solution. And that is you use low camera, uh, low light cameras, live streaming video video analytics, you have a 4G LTE and a smart iPhone app. And in this case, the, uh, the, the, the lady who's uh, operating this has, has, an, has an iPhone. The iPhone app does, does uh, analytics from the cloud, sends her a message on the app that says, we think that there are, are, are borders there. Uh, take a look and decide what you wanna do. So in this case, the information acquisition is fully automatic. Uh, the information analysis is fully uh, automatic, uh, automated. The decision and action selection is supported with all the analytics. And then the, the lady here presses the button and the action in, uh, implementation 
she presses the, the button on the, uh, on the iPhone app and the trap deploys. And she can watch numerous traps at the same time. And she can watch numerous traps at the same time while she's at Friday night watching her, her, her son play, play football at the high school. It, it's 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 really a game changer rather than having to sit in a blind for 24 hours a day only watching one trap. So I think you can see where I'm going at. You think of all the key decisions that we have in drilling. The dead man auto shear function. Well, that's completely autonomous. That's in the green going across the way because that's how it was designed. Kick detection and shut in. Uh, DD string commands. All the all the decisions you have to make, you can plot on this, and each will have a different profile. And a different profile would be appropriate for the different actions. So it's not one size fits all at all. So now I'm going to get into even more geeky stuff. So this will take about five minutes or so. Uh, I hope you stay awake. Uh, and I'm going to give you some frameworks to, to, to actually think about automation. The first is ISA 95, which is the Enterprise Control System uh, Integration. So this gives you from uh, five levels, level zero to level four. Uh, level zero is a physical process, in the case of cooking, cooking the meat. Uh, levels one and two are the manufacturing process, where you have your uh, VFDs and your PLCs, and you're monitoring and supervising the action on that particular item. Then one level above that is your manufacturing uh, uh, system where you have many different cells you have to keep coordinated. And then the level above that, level four, is your business system, your, lo your logistics and planning. Uh, the thing you should watch for is the latency of signals. The physical process, level zero, one and two, that is down at the milliseconds to seconds level. Level three, shift hours, minutes, and seconds. But level four is, uh, is you can do it from monthly basis, weeks, days. And so we're, since we're going to have a, a barbecue party, let's look at the different functions. Level zero is actually cooking the meat. Level one and two, well, level one is sensors. We, we, have, we saw these sensors before. Level two is the supervision of those sensors. Uh, in this case, uh, 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 through, the, through the iPhone app. And you can also have your automated uh, temperature control of your, of, your, of your grill. Level three is trying to keep the kitchen together to make sure that the dishes come out at the same time. And level four is, is going off to the super, uh, going off to the, uh, to the supermarket and sending out invitations. So we can do an automated sending out invitations, but the latency is not that critical. If someone sends their uh, invitation back, 15 minutes plus or minus really doesn't make a d big difference. But latency in terms of pulling the meat off the barbecue, off the grill, right at the right time, that is pretty uh, important. And latency uh, of 15 minutes it's a difference between good barbecue and bad barbecue. So you can see how as you go up the, up the food chain here, latency becomes uh, uh, more tolerable. Uh, in the, uh, in the uh, TSA roadmap, uh, this has been spelled out for us uh, by, by the authors in terms of the, um, of the of the hierarchy, ISA 95, of all the different tasks that we have. So we can just go into the, uh, to the framework and we can sort of see how we fit. So something like um, uh, a automated control of uh, 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 um, a crown saver or, a, or a, a, a floor saver on a top drive that better not have a lot of latency. That better be very quick, and that better be embedded down in the machine control, where what is the maximum weight on bit you can uh, run? Well, you can have a little bit of latency there, 
to give the machine uh, that, and you can do that decision at level five, at level three, and then move that down into level one to be executed. I hope that makes sense. Another way to look at this is uh, uh, the batch control system. So to automate cooking, you need uh, procedural control. These are recipes and you need a recipe to make your ice cream, to make your beer. And then below that, you need uh, more than that, you need to have a recipe written out and how to mix the ingredients uh, to heat when mixing, et cetera. You need tools to do it. You need physical stuff. You need a, a, a kitchen in a backyard with a grill. Well, in the kitchen, you need to have a lower level equipment. You need to have a snow a stove. Outside, you need to have a smoker, a grill. You need to have knives, pots and pans and utensils, et cetera. And then you have uh, the uh, procedural model, which are the tasks. And using a recipe and the equipment, you can then give an order to do a procedure that, 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 uh, that makes it. And this is uh, ISIA 88, the batch control system. And each of these levels gets up to seven levels. So I think of it like little Russian dolls. You can have the highest, oh, I'm gonna have a barbecue party. Well, then I'm gonna cook some meat. I'm gonna to have to cook some gravy. Well, I'm gonna to have to uh, clean the meat. I'm gonna to have to slice my vegetables. Uh, I'm gonna to have to make the gravy. Well, to make the gravy, I can first have to mix the ingredients and then I have to put it on the, on the pan. I have to make sure it doesn't, you can go down each step in that sort of way. Again, from the roadmap, uh, these are all the different systems that we have on a drilling rig. And to automate drilling, all you have to do is just break it down. So you can say, I need to drill a hole section. Okay, well, that's great. Well, then you can break it down one level, one level more. I need to trip in a hole. I need to drill ahead. I need to pull out a hole. I need to run casing. I need to cement. I need to nipple up, etc. Well, drilling ahead can be broken down more. I need to drill a stand. Then I need to make a connection. Well, making a connection, I need to drill the weight off. I need to stop the rotary. I need to come off bottom. I need to make, do I do a wiper trip? Yes or no. I need to shut down my pumps and then et cetera. So you can see how, how make, uh, drilling a whole section works very well at the top level. And then you just run down until you get to the detail level. And you get down to the detail uh, level enough that it makes sense for you. When Shell was doing this automated directional drilling uh, project, we did not do connections. So we just had one block make a connection. And then the, 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 the operators, uh, the driller and the rig floor did all that themselves. And then when they were done, we just continued the, 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 the recipe. Uh, there's a myth and uh, we should uh, uh, get that. Batch control does not require a human. Human tasks are standard in batch control. An example, confirm latch on the fingerboard before continuing. All batch control systems require human involvement. So there is not one batch control system that does not require human involvement. Even the, the most uh, uh, advanced uh, automated uh, autonomous car still needs a human if uh, it has a flat tire. I hope, uh, I hope I'm making sense. So we'll go on to uh, new versus obsolescence and repla uh, replacement. Uh, there are great new grills on the market. Uh, my son bought a grill a year and a half ago and the performance of that grill has not degraded. He could go on buy himself the latest new grill, but he's not going to. He's gonna save his money. He's gonna use the, the, the grill with year and a half old technology. My grill I bought when I was in Holland, it's rusty. The carryover tubes are leaking due to corrosion. It heats very unevenly. I, th I think it's a fire hazard and it's probably even a health hazard. Uh, and, and when I looked at what it would cost to refurbish this, <laughs> the refurbishment cost is about the same as replacement cost. So right now in my life, I'm looking for a nice new barbecue and I'm gonna buy it with the latest automation of course, with what my budget will afford. 
And the point about uh, this comment is right now with our current state of the industry, with the abundance of stacked rigs, uh, any performance improving technology, automation or digitalization needs to be easily retrofitted onto that. No one is going to go out and build a brand new automated rig when we have lots of already capitalized rigs so we can put back into the market. So that's sort of how the market swings. Once we use up our supply of currently uh, current, current rigs, then we can think about building brand new automated rigs. But I don't think that anyone is going to be building a brand new automated rig with our current uh, backlog of stacked rigs. So let's talk about the pit master. Who really needs automation? Automation in cooking. So we have two people here. We have uh, Greg Gatlin on the left and myself on the right. Greg is a Rice University grad. He's the owner of Gatlin's Barbecue that's been named the best barbecue in Houston by the Houston Press and several other publications. And he's one of the top five of top 50 barbecue uh, people in the state of Texas, according to Texas Monthly. And you have me over the on the right. I'm a University of Michigan grad. I really have low cooking skills. And I have low conscientiousness when it comes to cooking. And I drink on the job while I'm grilling. So, you know, who is a person in this picture who, who really needs automation? Well, let's look at Greg. Automation can remove mundane tasks and allow Greg to concentrate on the finer points of barbecue. Automation could help uh, Greg with maintaining the consistency of his restaurant while he's off and the sous chef is in charge. If there's such a thing as a sous chef in a barbecue place. And automation can help Greg if he opens up more restaurants. Huh. Do I need automation in my barbecue cooking? <laughs> Could automation make my barbecue edible? Could it raise my grade from failing to a D minus or maybe even a D plus? Well, Greg doesn't have a thing to worry about from Mark when it comes to barbecue cooking. I'm going to go play golf with my wife. I'm going to swing past uh, his joint. I'm going to buy my barbecue and I'll have wonderful barbecue. So the note is good automation makes high performers even better. It does not make low performers high performers and replace good humans. The good humans, it makes them even better. Social implications. Well, I really uh, have gotten in the future of work for about the last five years. I find it just a fascinating topic. I've been to a couple of rice conferences on uh, the future of work. I've attended a course at the Rice Glasscock School on the future of work. Uh, I've read books on the future of work and the, the plot I find is most interesting is over on the right. So this is US manufacturing and the blue you have employment, on the green you have labor, uh, sorry, uh, the orange you have labor output. So you have labor output that has been rising since the 1990s and employment that has been falling. That means labor productivity has been skyrocketing in the United States, which is great if you are the owner of, uh, of a company that wants to produce uh, 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 goods and services. It's not so good if you're an employee because employment has been dropping. And, and, and if so if your job involves manipulating data or doing a physical repetitive tasks, I think that you need to be concerned very much about automation. And what we see is automation is, they call it hollowing out the job skills uh, or the job market, where the high-end job people seen on the graph over on the right, their jobs are growing and their wages are growing. The, the low, the very low uh, wage uh, occupations, well, those are growing. Uh, take a maid at a, at a hotel. That's a job that's not going to be able to be automated easily because people leave the room in a, in a different state of, of mess 
when, when they leave a room. It's the middle, it's the middle uh, wage jobs that are falling, falling. So the good union jobs, um, the good, you know, I graduated, I can, uh, with just a high school degree and with just my right arm, I can make a good living for my family. Well, those jobs are disappearing because of automation. And I think that this is uh, something that our society is really going to have to deal with. So enough of, uh, oh, one more slide. So if we talk about the future of work, well, we have self-driving tr trucks. They have been on the road. Uh, there are 3.5 million professional truckers in the United States. Amazon Go, these are little shops. They're in prototype that people go in, they grab their stuff and they walk out and the system knows how much they need to be, uh, they need to pay. Well, there are 3.6 million cashiers in the United States. And autonomous sewing is, uh, is uh, being worked on very, very hard. And there are machines and prototype phases that can do uh, sewing uh, without human intervention. And there are 40 million garment workers in the world today. So any of these, uh, will really change the face of uh, of of uh, the U.S. and the world economy. <laughs> I, I used to say, you know, automation is the biggest thing. I think COVID is probably the biggest thing, but automation is the second biggest thing. And after we get COVID uh, under control, it will then become the biggest thing as uh, as a changing to to the to the work to the workplace. So with everything, uh, and this is my last slide of this part, uh, there are uh, advantages and disadvantages to automation. Uh, the main advantages are increased productivity and throughput, uh, increased consistency of output, reduction of direct uh, labor costs and expense. The main disadvantages are uh, security threats. While these things, if someone hacks in, they can take over your plant. Uh, there's a high initial cost and there's an unpredictable and ex excessive many times development cost to get this stuff uh, up and working there's a loss in flexibility it's difficult to modify a workflow and there's a loss of jobs so i don't think automation is the 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 the, the golden answer there are advantages and disadvantages to this so with that, I will turn it back over to uh, to uh, to David. Hopefully, there are some uh, questions, and not everyone has fallen asleep. No, we've definitely got some questions coming in. I do want to put out there. So we had a lot that started right around uh, talking about kind of the latency and what is real time. And Duncan Blue said, back in the day, real time meant whenever the boat could get the paper logs from the rig and mailed to the geologist. So. Just thought that was a funny comment. Thanks, uh, thanks, Duncan, uh, for and, watching and, the and, show. And, and and I have I have been there uh, when we first started with Shell. We all started in petrophysics, and uh, I took the logs from the Somerset engineer, got on a boat, drove into one Shell Square, handed them off, and then promptly fell asleep under my desk. Yep, I've <laughs> I've, I've done that. So we did have the the, the question, um, which I think we're going to answer probably in the next part. But Mohammed, I wanted to let you know we do have it up. So how about automated drilling systems? It's a very very broad question. I don't want to let uh, we're not ignoring it, but uh, try to be a little bit more specific with some of the stuff that we have going on because oh, that's okay. essentially what all of this is about. Right, right. So 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 Mohammed wants to get to the punchline. So what I was trying to do was I was trying to set up a broad picture of automation before we jump in and then talk about automation of drilling. So uh, he should have just tuned in for the second half. <laughs> <laughs> the second half of the show is where it ends. Yeah. All right. So then uh, Michael Gaines Jr. says, just wondering, I would think that there would be major differences between looking at on-prem versus cloud computing due to latency considerations. Can you talk more on that? So uh, if you look at on-prem versus latency, when you're talking about um, a drilling rig that's, that's off in the Permian and your office is in Houston or Dharan or wherever, the latency 
is the same because you're trying to get the the the, the dam signals off the rig into some sort of server. Uh, the the cloud is, has turned into be this really capable uh, 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 thing from where it was five and ten years ago. Uh, the the cloud it can be extremely fast, uh, extremely uh, extremely good. So there are many companies, Shell being one of it, that we're moving all our data centers from on prem up into the cloud. Of course, that's not something that you do in, in a week or a month. It takes several years to do that. But the cloud has turned out to be a very secure, a very robust uh, infrastructure for, to, for doing your computing. Uh, David Reed said, perhaps we should use women. Uh, they are better than uh, better than both, I believe. When we were just speaking about uh, men are better, our machines are better. That was from 1951, uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> and, and I agree that women are better <laughs> at like everything anyway. So, yeah, there you go. I would like to throw out here. So Shane Hanson, who has been on the show before, uh, he says the future is here. The future is now. Previously, operators were skeptical to embrace such a departure into the future, but that, but now they are very much embracing get on board or get hit by the train. So as I'm trying to scroll through here and find some more of the, uh, we did have a question. So um, drilling automation will create jobs or, or hurts current jobs question. I, so, so I think that it's going to be a mitz bag. It's some, some it will help and some it's going to hurt. I, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think everyone, it will help everyone, nor do I think it's gonna, it's gonna uh, hurt everyone. Uh, maybe I'll get to that more uh, as we get into the specific questions. Uh, hold, hold that thought because uh, I, I don't think it's even across the board. We also had uh, using barbecue as an analogy is a bad idea. I'm hungry now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, yep, uh, um, apologies for that. <laughs> uh, hold on, I'm just, there's a lot of comments to roll through here, guys. Sorry, I'm not looking at the camera, I'm looking down at my computer, but you know, we're just trying to be able to. Okay, here we go. Uh, how much can we save per well with automation versus how much we can lose if the systems shut down suddenly during operations? Hey, that Hope, that's a great question. When I was in Gabon and a gorilla would walk by the rig, well, the rig would shut down while all the humans looked at, at, at the gorilla. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I, don't, I, I, I don't think that humans' operations, you know, uh, someone goes and, and gets his, uh, his uh, finger uh, clipped, well, then that rig is shut down as well. So, so I don't, I don't think that uh, humans are, are, are perfect, nor do I think automation is perfect. It reminds me of when I was working offshore in Australia and we had a, uh, a whale go by and was, uh, you know, yep. breaching and stuff. And it was pretty like even the company man, everybody, anybody had a camera came outside and started taking pictures, no hot work permits, nothing like yep. that. It was like... No. We and, are and the stopping rigs, what we're doing and taking and the pictures. Rigs, and the rigs started to list because uh, <laughs> because everyone is off on the on the side looking over the handrail. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Um, here we go. Do you think the API should look into updating procedures in light of functional requirements of the drilling systems data in the era of automated data acquisition? John Carney with the question. Thanks, John. So, so, uh, so I'm going to say uh, yes, but as a precursor, it should be groups like uh, 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 SPE and IEDC who take that sort of um, uh, discussion forward. Then if we ever need a standard, that's where API can jump in. So API is not good at having a good, uh, a, a big open sort of discussion. But the the but John's exactly right. Organizations need to take this forward, and API is one of those when it comes to a standard. 
So, so, so I'd suggest John uh, get involved with DSATs or IDC Arts, and uh, and then he can be uh, in the thick of uh, in the thick of this. And I will throw out a quick warning to anybody who talks to Mark Anderson about ideas within DSATs, SBE, or IADC. If you say, hey, you know what I think would be a really good idea? You will soon be the um, subcommittee chair for a completely new charter within the SBE DSATs group. <laughs> this guy right here. Just letting you know. So if you have ideas, you better be ready to execute on them. Don't brainstorm with somebody else before you, you go throw the stuff around at, uh, at Mark, uh, which kind of brings I'm us. Just, I'm just a pensioner. I'm, uh, you don't expect me to do real work. Do you? So, uh, so Juan's as, and this is kind of goes to some of the stuff that we're doing within DSATS software architect and consultant. How about coming up with an open source solution for drilling automation system? Yes. And so there are, closed systems, there are open systems. Uh, what we've seen in other software domains is open systems are beating closed systems. But I think that that's gonna take quite some time before that really gets embedded, especially when you're talking about machine control. And I would recommend, uh, Swan, uh Follow uh, or get in touch uh, with anybody that's within. It could be myself. It could be Mark. Um, the DSATS group. We there are a couple of different subcommittees that that are broaching some of these topics. Uh, there's the Open API Software group that uh, or that subcommittee that I am the chair of, where we are finding all of these uh, softwares and these uh, compatible systems and putting a list together. Um, there's also some of the work that. Um, uh, Paul Pastusik is doing. Uh, and then I can't remember the other group. I felt like there's another subcommittee that was uh, doing some stuff with this. But there, there's there's plenty within the DSATS organization to where if you want to get involved with some of those things, uh, that you can. Uh, and there is a, mo a movement within the industry for that. Uh, finally, next, uh, uh, Belim asking another question, uh, where to learn and get job related to automation? So I gave a uh, references uh, at the beginning, and those are in your post, uh, uh, David. So you can just go uh, take your time, go click on these, and you'll find resources. And there is a lot of learning available. There's a, a lot of material that you can learn from that's available. Yes, and then Martin said, open source is something different from open systems. Yes, that is correct. Um, and we are trying to be able to come up with kind of that list within the DSATS organization of what's what's open source, what's uh, what's what's an open system, um, so that you know more people can be able to kind of interact and things aren't just uh, siloed to a specific company or organization. Yeah, and if I could jump in, uh, if you yes, have sir. machine, if you have machine control, uh, let's say uh, uh, NOV DrawWorks. NOV might not want you just to go try some software that will that will control the uh, the the acceleration deceleration uh, uh, and and let your block drop, but maybe they'll be willing to have uh, let you try a ROP optimization software that sends a set point of of uh, block descent and an ROP uh, RPMs to maximize uh, rate of penetration, maybe they'll let you send a set point into their system to try out. So there are different levels of, of that. If you think in terms of ISA 95, that I think you need to be very careful at the machine control that someone doesn't go in and, and mess that up, but at the set point uh, level that you push down into the machines, that, that, can, that can be done. And then we have here, um, so it says LinkedIn user, but I actually know who this LinkedIn user, this is uh, John DeWart. Uh, and so he put up there, if you guys are on LinkedIn, there's actually a link there, portal to the DSA information, dsabach.org. So if you guys would yeah. like, wait till the show's over, then go check it out. Or you could just open it in a new tab, but don't leave the show yeah, just yeah. yet. So guys, uh, 
we've we've covered all the questions for this part. We'll go on to the second part. This is where we're going to start to see examples uh, of things that are specific to uh, the drilling industry. And then we'll see if you really want to use the word automation anymore. Um, oh, wait, oh, wait. Hold on. We got one more question that came in real, real quick. I'll let this one slide through. Um, can we automate flat time operations using drilling automation systems? Uh, absolutely. And I hopefully you will see several examples of that. If not, come back at the end and uh, I'll, I'll try to answer that in more detail. But but all sorts of things uh, uh, can be automated. Everything should be uh, everything should be on the table. All right. Well, one more question came in because I, I I like Aaron so much. What do you think is the best personal strategy for service companies providing automated drilling? Should an issue arise for which personnel on location is needed? Do you think rig companies providing automated drilling will cross train hands on location to assist in these instances? Excellent question. So I think that we're going to have to become better at. Uh, at how we provide the drilling package to operators to reduce total cost. So, so right now with our current oil cost, operators aren't making money, they're going bankrupt. Service companies are going bankrupt. Drilling contractors are going bankrupt. We better start to do something that will allow the industry to reduce the total cost to allow us to continue. There we go. Um, we've had just a couple more comments that came in talking about invisible lost time. Um, before we go into any of those, we'll save those for the next part. But I also recommend if you guys want to look at anything as far as NPT, ILT, those things, Peter Aird's conversation from last week would be absolutely crucial for you to watch. Um, and that one's just on YouTube because we had some other issues. And guess what? Oh, yeah, we're back on LinkedIn Live. So. I didn't even announce that at the beginning of the show because it did another test earlier this week, but we're on LinkedIn Live. So there we go. All right, uh, Mark, I've got your presentation up. We'll pull the lost time stuff off. It is the floor is yours, sir, or the internet is yours. Oh, and real quick, that it says to hide the thing down there at the bottom. Can you click that for me, Mark? Oh, I have. Oh, yes. Sorry, that was that was there the whole time. Well, just in case there's something important uh, there at the bottom. Uh oh, oh wait, there it is. Okay, yeah, we almost had Inception. Okay. LinkedIn Inception just took place, you guys. All right, I'm off. It, it is yours, Mark. Okay, so uh, you, you can see the slides. I have to come back so. off for that part. Yes, yes, we can see the slides. Sorry, I took myself right, okay. off, then you can't hear me. Then, yes, you're good to go. Okay, so here we go, part two. And, and uh, so the question is, can drilling be automated? And I really didn't answer that in the first hour. So hopefully I will get around to answering it this time. If not, you can uh, hold my feet to the fire in Q&A. So we're going to look at examples in drilling in the future. So, so here's a picture of drilling in Colorado in 2008. And you can just see by that picture that it looks like a very manual task. Here's a pi uh, picture of uh, the Synergy rig that was uh, a, a uh, NOM rig, uh, shell rig, uh, in the Netherlands in 2015, and the drillers drilling ahead. And you can see that there is automation going on. So, so, I, so what I'm going to do is talk about how we go from that picture on the left to more the picture on the right. So why should we automate? Well, we tell the triller, don't buckle the pipe, don't exceed the maximum uh, RPMs, uh, stay on target, huh. maximum weight on bit, don't exceed that, drill efficiency, avoid lateral vibrations, avoid stick slip, uh, don't stall the motor, don't stall the top drive, drill faster, uh, watch out, uh, connection, uh, uh, condition the hole, uh, clean the hole, uh, time is money, oh, oh by the way, Safety is first. I think the poor driller has a lot on his plate and I think automation can do a lot to help clear his plate that he can start to focus on things that are, that are, that are important. And so the first example I'll use is kick detection. 
Well, every time you make a connection, there's alarm that goes off for low flow. And humans aren't good at detecting a change on the strip charts in real time. So expecting a person to concentrate on those, those plots that we all have seen and see when things are changing is, is not a particularly good task for, for humans. And we know uh, from some uh, internal benchmarking, internal to shell, that we, uh, that we have kicks on connections about 25% of the time. Join ahead is about 25%, tripping is about 50%. So we decided to do a project, we in this case being Shell, on improving uh, connection, uh, kick detections during connections. And what we, uh, uh, what we came up with, Brian Tarr was the, uh, was the, uh, the, the chief, uh, the, the, uh, the, the project manager on this, um, the project leader, uh, was to put two sensors for all key parameters with independent physics. So that would help uh, with the sensor part of it, getting accurate data. And then using algorithms, in this case, as you shut the, the pumps off, you get a, a flow back and that flow back declines. And that flow back declines based on the speed that the driller turns the pumps off. So using the algorithm to detect abnormalities and then using a clear enunciation to the driller to, uh, to, uh, to show him the abnormalities that we're seeing. In this case, there's a pop-up window. And the pop-up window that you see on the chart on the right is there's an extensive uh, pit volume gain uh, flagged. And... Uh, then the driller makes the shut-in decision. And so the driller uh, could shut the well in, or he could take a look around. And he could look down at the pits and see a Bubba there with a hose filling the pits. And in that case, the correct decision is not to shut in the well. It's to tell Bubba to stop filling the pits with, with, with a hose. So this is a, a kick detection, and you can think back to the levels of uh, the levels of uh, autom uh, autonomy uh, in decision making that we have, where we focused on information acquisition, information processing, presenting that data to the human, and then letting human make the uh, make the decision. So I'm going to give you now four examples of uh, real-time drilling advisory app store. So these are little digitalization, different programs that are being run to help show the driller, much like the, the kick, kick detection, uh, uh, what is going on. And these are, are listed in uh, the SBAE paper that's uh, listed there. The first one is under reamer health monitoring. When you're on a deep water drilling rig and you're drilling ahead with a, with the under reamer, from the floor, you cannot tell the health of the under reamer. You can't tell whether the uh, under reamer is fully deployed or not deployed or damaged. And uh, that becomes especially uh, uh, troublesome when you're drilling from a uh, soft, uh, uh, hard formation into a uh, soft formation. When the bit punches through into the soft formation, the under reamer can take a lot of uh, weight and damage it. And this was a real uh, problem in our deep water uh, operations. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the guys, not, not me, the guys thought about the, um, let me see if I can get this up. Um, the guys saw that we had a, a, a gamma ray that had a torque sub here. And that torque sub and the surface torque can be compared. And then using some machine learning, uh, we can detect the health of that under reamer. And so we set up a screen here that has a, a little red for, uh, for, for a problem, green for, for, for good. Um, and we were able to run this and tell the, the, the driller uh, offshore how his, uh, the health of his under reamer. 
the next one is uh, 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 we decided that it worked with underweamer, so we could do this with uh, with bitware prediction. So in this uh, this case, the bitware is tracked as you drill ahead. Again, calibrating with uh, with uh, with uh, the bits that have been pulled to see the cumulative wear to try to pull the bit just before it became damaged beyond repair, because that would be excess of uh, or is about one day's rig time if you if you uh, wiped out a bit and you saw this little line just increasing it was green now it's in yellow and if it ever became red you were you were in, in grave danger of uh, of wiping out your bit or the bit had been wiped out uh, offshore there's a thing that uh, was uh, hydraulicing and that is where you're trying to drill ahead but there, but the but the 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 the, the jets in the mud press uh, do, with hydraulic force lift the bit off the bottom, and it's uh, it's uh, it's observable by the surface parameters, but the driller's busy doing other things. So we set up a little app that would look at uh, how uh, compare the different features and then give an indication of. Uh, hydraulicing, and uh, this is especially true when you're drilling out the uh, drilling out the uh, uh, out the shoes, uh, and then that worked uh, very successfully. And another one is uh, real time casing wear prediction. Well, we had a model that we could put in uh, before the well a planned trajectory, and we could calculate casing wear prediction. We have we have the uh, the same model that we could do after the well, and we could do use the actual uh, uh, well trajectory, and then give an estimate of of um, of casing wear. Uh, but we had no real time capability, and uh, on one of our uh, deep water uh, rigs, uh, one of the TLPs. Uh, the decision to pick up um, uh, non-rotating uh, casing uh, drill pipe centralizers was a million and a half dollar decision, and we had a well that's trajectory was maybe we'll need them, maybe we won't need them. So what we did is we devised a seam that would take the actual trajectory uh, in real time, and real time is uh, is again latency every four hours. It would then recalculate the predicted casing wear and see if it was trending as predicted, trending less than what we predicted before we started to drill the well, or drilling more than we predicted uh, as, as we were drilling the well. If it was trending as or more, we'd have to pick up the casing, uh, the drill pipe centralizers non-rotating drill pipe centralizers if it was trending less then we thought that we could get away without that million and a half dollar cost of picking up the non-rotating casing centralizers so we ran this every four hours and then we gave an update and we set this up uh, on, uh, uh, as an automated uh, uh, call and uh, it was uh, pushed to the to our uh, monitoring center and to the rig site uh, and because we didn't want to have to wake up at night every four hours, we set this up autom automatically. It worked, it worked fine. And based on some of the questions uh, that came in uh, when, uh, when David asked uh, uh, if there were any questions beforehand, there was a swab surge uh, question. So I threw in a slide here. Conventional way of uh, calculating swab surge is an engineer calculates uh, the trip speed to to avoid swab surge pre well or maybe just before the trip and he would come up with something like uh, two minutes per stand in the open hole and 30 uh 30 seconds per per stand in the case hole below five thousand feet above five thousand feet just trip it out as fast as you can there are lots of assumptions that uh that uh that are that go into that and there's a generally a poor adherence by a driller. Well, if we have some uh, some some uh, some bright pe uh, people, they can they can uh, calculate the optimum speed for every foot 
that you pick up the uh, the, the top drive, and 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 this uh, the engineer she could uh, calculate that, and then you could set up a, uh, a a sort of a curve here that looks at the maximum speed uh, to eliminate uh, uh, swabbing. And you start very slowly. And then as the pipe starts to move, you can increase that until you get right up to, to the top. And then you then the, sp the speed decreases. And this is a minimum swabbing type profile, but certainly not a two minutes per stand profile of, of constant block speed. And then using a, 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 a RESTful API, you uh, you can uh, you can hit that RESTful API. It can give you that back based on real time real time measurements of the of of the uh, of the mud of the trajectory of the of, of other dynamic uh, characterizations. And if you tell that to 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 any driller, he's going to look at you like you you're an engineer. But you can just input that directly into the control system uh, to give the the optimum uh, pull rate for pulling off bottom to avoid swabbing. Soft torque rotary system uh, is uh, to uh, break down slipstick harmonics. This is a system that. Uh, takes uh if you have a system that takes over 70 milliseconds latency the performance degrades to the point that it's no longer effective so this has to sit inside the vfd or be very closely associated with the vfd below the uh the the, the plc uh a system again you you turn it on and then it works completely uh, autonomously at uh, at less than seventy milliseconds, and it can uh, it can uh, break slipstick uh, automatically. So I have here a picture of an auto driller. This is how auto drillers used to look like. This when I first started in the industry, this is what an auto driller looked like. Uh, now we have top drive rigs. And the top uh, and the joystick can control the, the 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 top drive, the draw works, and the mud pumps. And and the, the key here is uh, on a joystick rig, the the top drive, draw works, and mud pumps don't actually care if the signal's coming from a human operating a manual joystick or a drilling control system PLC. So it doesn't the draw works doesn't really care if you're sending it every every second a new maximum speed to uh, to uh, to give the optimum profile for 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 swabbing in the well. It just it's, it's just happy and it will just lift the drill string. Uh, ROP and bit life optimization is uh, is. Uh, is, is one uh, Teal started to work on this uh, in 1965, and he came up with an equation. And what we find is there's no single satisfactory uh, 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 ability to optimize ROP based on physics or based on numerical approaches. Uh, the physics models don't encode, uh, don't. Uh, incorporate static and dynamic parameters where model-based uh, approaches are very good for what you've just drilled to give you optimum parameters for what you just drilled, which isn't very useful when you've already drilled it. But a combination of the two becomes very powerful. And in, in this case I'm showing, this is an Exxon Mobil case that they've uh, done with, uh, with uh, Payson where they're using advanced control techniques, uh, physics-based models, and numeric-based uh, numeric controls to, uh, to optimize ROP. And I think that you're gonna see a lot more of these sorts of systems out to optimize ROP. Uh, all you have to do is do a quick search of the web, and there are uh, numerous numbers of master students are doing optimum ROP uh, measurements, uh, 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 optimum ROP algorithms. Uh, directional drilling. So in my simple uh, simple uh, um, 
uh, way of thinking. Directional drilling is you get a survey, you uh, make a projection of the well path, and you see how that compares to your plan. And then you might need to make a steering command, and then you have to execute the steering command. With an RSS, you need to manipulate the pumps to get a downlink. With a motor and vent sub, you need to manipulate the top drive draw works and mud pumps to, to affect the steer. A uh, picture I have over, uh, uh, over on the right is from Motive. Neighbors has a system. There are other people who have systems that, that can uh, do uh, to automated directional drilling. The, uh, this system, uh, this graph I'm showing is... Um, Call from West Western I am. So, sorry, the joys of working from home. Uh, people are calling you uh, all the time. <laughs> no worries, to, Mark. No worries. Why, 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 why to, to, to sell you something that you, you actually don't need? Anyway, so this is a slide that shows uh, remote directional drilling. Uh, and this is a, a Hess and neighbor slide. And what, uh, what they did is they moved the uh, directional drillers from the rig site to a central, uh, a central site, uh, a, a remote center. And then they give commands back to the rigs to execute uh, slides. And then they have a roving directional driller that goes around to the rigs uh, during particularly difficult hole sections, or maybe uh, some driller is a little bit green and he's having more difficulty executing the slides. And with that, they get a couple of benefits. One benefit is they have a reduced number of people, so that's less cost. But the, the, the better benefit is they get the very best directional drillers into that center, and then, then that best directional driller can input her, um, her knowledge out to all the rings. The, the, the last benefit is once the people in the directional center see more well data, more, more live action, they get up the learning curve very much faster. And then they can uh, say to each other, hey, this is strange. And someone else, oh, I saw that a couple of weeks ago. This is how you deal with that. So the learning becomes much more, the t feedback on the learning becomes uh, much, much quicker. Uh, BOP testing. Uh, this is a project that we started to execute with Shell. The, uh, the circular chart recorder on the uh, left that you see, the patent, was actually issued in 1888. So, and that's a key, uh, the key uh, 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 gauge output for your BOP test. Well, we can move that over to a, a computer. We also looked at turning valves and also identifying uh, leaking valves with ultrasonics. So a nice little package that would go on to uh, BOP testing. The, uh, the, the digital pressure testing, uh, uh, BOPX's Easy Chart has, has a Pelican case and modules uh, with a PC in it. And the modules in it are planning, monitoring the testing and automatically recording when a test has, or automatic signifying when a test has passed. Uh, it can uh, record all the time. So you set up key performance indicators to, to uh, see how the, how the crew is doing on time between tests and how that test is performing. It automatically spits out reports. So unlike a circular chart, you get a nice, uh, uh, PDF file or printed file. There's uh, support, and you can you can remotely monitor. You can remote into that PC uh, if you if you so choose. So BOP testing. Th this is one of the flat times that you can automate. Mud check automation. This was a skid that we started in in Shell. We donated that to the University of Texas, and they have progressed with the technology. And this is trying to get all the mud checks done by in an in a automatic uh, uh, way. Uh, we, were, we were somewhat successful with getting many of the checks done. One of the issues is if you get 75% of the mud checks 
done automatically, you still have 25% uh, that you still need to do manually. So you still have to have a mud engineer to do the 25% manual. Well, if you have a, a person there, why would you pay for the automation of 75% when you have a person there that can do all that? So that's the dilemma with, uh, with mud checking is you really have to get to the point that you can remove the, the mud engineer to do mud checks from the rig uh, completely before you get his cost down that allows you to pay for the cost. Unless you're in some sort of deep water operations where the rig costs and the savings from just uh, the rig time can pay for the automation. Uh, here's another uh, 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 thing that we started with the University of Houston, uh, we meaning Shell, uh, and that is uh, using video analytics to monitor the cuttings loading on shale shakers. And, and uh, cutting loadings on shell shakers is something right now that is uh, completely blind to any sort of digital system, but using, using video analytics, we wanted to know whether it was uh, low, medium, or high. And we could sort of make a curve then versus time to uh, see the effectiveness of our bottom-up circulations to see when it was okay to pull out a hole. Uh, there was some... Uh, uh, good progress made by this. Uh, Shell uh, allowed uh, the University of Houston, uh, who was uh, ex executing this project, to to go forward and and uh, uh, commercialize that with the with the industry. So let's talk about uh, rig floor automation and eliminating hands, people's hands touching pipe. So when I look at that picture, I think it looks like a safety hazard. Uh, in, in this case, uh, and this just happens to be a Weatherford product, a Weatherford has a, has a uh, automated tong that can fit inside the carrier to a, uh, to a iron roughneck to uh, make up casing. And they have uh, quite a few uh, uh, automated features in that. So you can make up casing with no hand, with no people's hands touching uh, the pipe. So that's a, a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, nice uh, facility uh, to do with uh, casing. And you'll notice that you have hydraulic hoses coming to that. And this one, neighbors was nice enough to send me their, uh, their slide. Uh, neighbors uh, with uh, a Norwegian company, uh, RDS Robotics Drilling Systems, are doing uh, a whole rig floor robots, a whole series of rig floor robots based on electrical motors. So in the previous one, we saw hydraulics. Here we see electrics. The advantage of hydraulics is you get a lot of force. The disadvantage of hydraulics is it's not as accurate as electric motors. Here they have their electric motors uh, and, and levers set up that uh, it can handle uh, normal rig floor operations and it's much more precise. And so they're gonna be out onto a, to a deep water uh, a platform in the Norwegian sector uh, fairly soon trying this sort of robotics technology out. And what I haven't covered in this is a whole series of things. I didn't cover managed pressure drilling, shutting in, circulating out a kit, remote mud locking. Then that's what this uh, picture over on the right, which is a slumber shade picture on, on how you can do remote mud logging, automated geostream. There are so many more things that are going on, but in view of the time, uh, I, I, I haven't covered. So the future of digitalization and drilling uh, and automation and drilling. My view is digital solutions are only going to get better from here. And automation is only going to get better from here. So anyone who's out there who's thinking, uh, well, it might be good now, but it's just a passing fad. It's not going to become as good as it was, uh, as it is now. Uh, I don't think it, I think it's just going to become uh, better. And the costs of digital and automation will continue to decline. Given our current market conditions, I think that anyone 
who is trying to come up with a digital uh, or automated system that has to make it retrofitable to our existing rig fleet. And I think that we should focus on augmenting the, uh, the, the great workforce we have out in the field. And, and my point here is with the current downturn in the number of layoffs, only the best will still have jobs. Certainly we have the best. We have great people who have gotten layoffs, uh, gotten laid off, but there are an awful lot of, uh, and everyone who remains is going to be the very best performers. So if we can use uh, automation and digitalization to augment them, to make them even better, then that's the way that we need to, to focus going forward. And I think we have to do this to make drilling performance better now, of course, but actually to get ready for the next upturn. Because with, with this, with this uh, down market, uh, if it continues much longer, we're going to start to atrophy our capability to pick up these rigs when we need to. And so what happens every time when you start to pick up rigs, the performance declines dramatically. There was a rig that when we were joined up in Wyoming, uh, we meaning Shell, that we came to the end of a drilling budget uh, about mid-November. We laid down the rig picked it back up in January, and the performance had just gone down to the floor and had to be rebuilt. A great performing rig, a month and a half off, pick it back up, and the performance was not what it was before it was uh, lost. Having that for just one rig on scale like we have now, we really need automation to help with when we finally have the upturn. And with that, uh, David, I'm uh, here I for some questions. Back here with you. Well, <laughs> it's interesting enough. We'll throw this one off with somebody who used to be my boss. Uh, oh, says LinkedIn user, but this is Femi Deramola. He was actually my boss when I worked in Sail Australia. So I talked about you know being offshore in Australia and seeing the whale and stuff. This is the guy that was actually my boss at the time. So he says, automation doesn't equate to cost reduction, does it? Question mark. Uh, so automation is going to be more expensive to put it put out there. So if you have an iron roughneck and you have an automated iron roughneck, the automated iron roughneck is going to be more expensive than one without automation. The performance will get will will become better if it's if it's good automation. If it's bad auto, automation, then maybe the performance gets even worse. So if, if, if it's bad automation, well, you just wipe that off the table and you wait for good automation. So, so, so you, you have a cause and effect and the whole, the whole, the total cost of ownership, the, 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 the total needs to, needs to improve. So next did, one's I, from... did, I, did, I flub, did I flub my way through that, that question? <laughs> I, I I am not passing any judgment, sir. Uh, how does swab surge models look against APWD data in reality? Uh, uh, APWD. Uh, I'm gonna guess automated pressure, pressure wall, drilling? wall drilling. Automated pressure wall drilling. Ha, so th this is an interesting one. Uh, so 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 um, uh, as as you're drilling ahead, especially say managed pressure drilling, you get a bomb hole pressure up uh, through the through the mud stream. That's like really this horrible uh, signal um, conduit. It's it just comes in late, but you, you get it up there and then you can recalibrate your physical models based on an actual physical reading. And then as you go forward, you use your physical models that have just been calibrated until you get the next signal up and then you recalibrate going forward. So, so what you want to do is you want to use your uh, pressure pile drilling signal to calibrate your physical swab surge models. Oh, somebody says it's annular pressure while drilling. Okay, not annular automated pressure. Pro Sorry, guys. I mean, okay. I can't yeah. keep track of all the acronyms that happen in this industry. Just, just yeah. can't do it. Um, okay, so, so the physical models oh. are good. Physical models that have been calibrated with real-time data are better. 
There we go. So uh, James James Reagan it says PLCs don't like to be shut down? Question mark. Uh. I can't any give you any more than, context than that. <laughs> okay, well, any more than my than my uh, than my uh, computer uh, likes to be uh, to re be rebooted. So this morning I had when I when I when I turned on my computer I had this little thing. Uh, uh, that there's a new software release, and I could have hit it, but the last time I did that, it was a 45 minute reboot. And and because I didn't want to be late for the show, I didn't hit it. So 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 you have to shut down your PLCs when it's the right time to shut them down. So uh, I don't I, I don't know if I answered James' uh, question uh, particularly well, but but th there's a whole strategy that you have to do to 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 help you help you with uh with with managing your PLCs. We do have one here. Whether we got the question right or, or not, sorry. We, we do our best here on the Vidor Locksmith Show, guys. <laughs> Are there enough electrical and electronics field engineers available to manage the maintenance and repair? The skill is at a premium, and this is very costly. What are your views? Sandy, thanks for asking and being a part of the show. Oh, I need so, to put it on Q&A now. Go ahead. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Okay, yeah. There we so, go. so, th so, so, Sandy brings up a really interesting point, and that is about the workforce of the future. And we're going to have to have rig crews that can do basic sensor calibrations, basic sensor maintenance. Uh, if all of a sudden uh, the top dry, uh, the, uh, the 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 hook load sensor isn't working, you want to have a person who can just go do some basic stuff to see if it can get it working again. You don't want to have some guy drive 500 miles out to location just to plug something in. So, so we'll, we'll have to have more skills with the current rig staff. The rig electricians are going to have to be more uh, sensory type persons. It's not just keeping the, the generators running. We're also going to have to have uh, sensors that are that are more self-calibrating sensors that are easier to work with, and then you put in redundancy. So uh, if if your uh, hook uh, if your uh, hook load is a, is a critical sensor, we'll just put in two two sensors, and then uh, if one craps out, then you can put it on the uh, on the maintenance list and continue to run off the other one until the guy comes by, and then he can handle that one and and the other stuff on the rig. So going with that same uh, trend there, then Franz has a question, what skills should we look at as far as being ready for the upturn, uh, mechatronics, programming, electronics, Elon Musk, and Neuralink? Huh. So what, what skills? So, so uh, uh, yeah, so, so I personally like mechatronics. I've advised several of my friends, uh, several of my friends' kids, to look at a megatronics. You can get a associate's degree at a community college in megatronics and have a degree that you can come out and you can make a good salary and you can jump up into the six figures being a megatronics technician. So I personally advise many of my friends that that's a great way to deal with their kids. One, one of my close friends has a, a, a kid who, uh, who did a degree in music. Well, his musical career wasn't paying the bills. So he's just finished up a, a megatronics uh, degree uh, with Austin Community College and has and had a choice of job offers. Uh, you know, something that he as a musician is, is you know, he, he now is paying for his own apartment. His, my, my friend, the, parent, the parents are just, are just so happy. So, so yeah, so there's megatronics and that has programming skills in it and it has electronic skills in it. So, so uh, associate's degree in megatronics is, is a great way if, uh, if, if you're doing that, uh, a full degree in megatronics, full degree in engineering is, is, is great. And then uh, not so much a question, but John said, uh, John DeWart said, 
digitalization and automation augmentation of drilling and advancing more rapidly than anticipated due to COVID and oil price starting to plan to update DSA roadmap in 2021 catch up and look out to 2030 so just just throwing that one out there yeah um, uh, so so if i can make a comment again so yes, the sir, dsa roadmap was put together by i think 30 different authors it was done a, a, a couple of years ago it needs to be updated because it needs to be updated every two years but also after the initial publication We've learned a lot more, so it needs to be updated again. John is going to run an effort to update that next year. That will be a very interesting thing. And if you want to learn something, going back to the, the previous question, get involved with something like the, the, the roadmap initiative, because then you're in the middle of it and you will learn a lot. Uh, and then the bit about uh, the downturn uh, of, of the industry. There, there's some perception that all of a sudden a lot of the old commercial barriers that were blocking technology have evaporated. That, that uh, say, a blue system didn't want to talk to a red system, that didn't want to talk to a, uh, a green drilling contractor. Well, now everyone's just happy for a job. And if we can reduce the, co the total cost of that well, by working together, well, maybe that's a good thing. Thank you, sir. So uh, Gregory had said, you need mud loggers with roughneck skills. <laughs> and and you need uh, roughnecks that can go catch a sample and put it into the automated, uh, 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 automated uh, mud logging. Absolutely. Uh, Multi-skilling will be, will be more and more, uh, will be more and more uh, uh, needed. Uh, as Sarah said, you put efficiency on the fact the best of engineers will be the ones to stay when automation has been fully deployed in the drilling industry. What will make these engineers stand out? Their knowledge in automation? Question mark. So how oh, to be the so, last of the last? Oh, okay, yeah. As someone who who lived through the early '80s uh, uh, downturn uh, and, and had a had a full career. Uh, uh, I, I think that luck is like really important to keeping your job. Uh, so, so, so number one is you want to be lucky. Uh, Which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, some people are, some people are unlucky. Some people are lucky. Um, uh, you, you need to have knowledge of, of automation, certainly, but you also need to be able to work in a team because we're going to have to have multifunctional teams to work this. So if you're a programmer, you're going to have to get along with field hands because field hands are the people with the knowledge of what goes on in the field. Well, likewise, if you're a field hand, you're going to have to get along with the programmer because to, to help him program, you have to work in a team. So, so teamwork is going to be another key skill. Uh, and there, there are an awful lot of programmers and field hands who don't get along well with each other. Well, you'll see those pushed out and you'll see people who can collaborate in a team uh, 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 be put in. And then there's you know basic performance issues. Uh, you know you, you have to show up to work on time. you have to to meet your deadlines, you have to do what you say. So so there are all sorts of skills that will allow you to, to stay to stay in the industry besides just luck. Well, I think as of right now, that was the last question. We don't have any others coming in. It, uh, I think you've covered a lot of stuff very well today. So, Mark, I appreciate that very much. Uh, so I'm going to do a, uh, one little quick announcement for myself. If you guys have it, uh, I did a podcast uh, with Garima on the dais. Uh, so that podcast is out today. If you want to go listen to me blabber on about a whole bunch of nonsense while I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago. So I promised her I would do this. So there it is. Uh, another little update. I'm going to get some shirts made. So if you guys are any, anybody's interested in to buy their Gibson reports or the potential of a Vidor locksmith uh, stuff, uh, I will be getting some of that put out there. So I just wanted to throw both of those out there real quick. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really do appreciate it. Um, 
it's a lot of the questions have slowed up here. So there we go. Uh, quick announcements. Uh, next week, we're going to have Kurt Meyer on the show. He's going to be doing a study on the Haynesville Shale. Uh, Kurt's also got a lot of really, really great content on YouTube. So if you haven't found him, go find him on LinkedIn and then also find some of the stuff that he's put onto YouTube. Uh, the week after that, we're going to be talking about uh, automation uh, within machine learning and artificial intelligence with the IBM team. It is going to be absolutely amazing. So they're really gonna break down what are the cases, what are the applications, what do you need to know, what kind of data do you need to have, all of these things around being able to do some kind of artificial intelligence or machine learning application, and then give us a complete breakdown. There's gonna be several people on that. Like it's the entire IBM, IL, I, AI ML team uh, on there. It's like alphabet soup trying to announce all of that stuff. So uh, be sure to tune in. So Kurt Meyer next week, uh, IBM the week after that, uh, the week after that, I don't know. I'm probably going to take like a week of vacation or something from the show just to relax a little bit. because These shows do take a lot of effort to be able to put together. So it might take a little bit of time. Uh, LinkedIn user said, David Gibson and Mark Anderson, great presentation. Thanks for the references to the DSA roadmap and DS Bach. I believe that was John DeWork, even though it says LinkedIn user. Uh, Christian says, good stuff. Thanks. And Jason says, great job, guys. Thanks. Well, we appreciate all of y'all taking the time to be able to watch. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for taking the, the opportunity to be on the show for a second time. If you guys haven't seen it, go back to the show links. Uh, and find the one with Mark Anderson. Uh, it was a great interview where we kind of just sit down and had more of a conversation. And that was just prior or just after. I can't remember. I think it was just after we had done the, um, what was it? The 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 DSATS meeting in November of yep. last year. The John so, DeWart meeting. Yep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we've had a couple other people say good presentation. Thanks. Uh, Allison said really good. Thank you guys all so much. We really do appreciate it. I think, I don't think I have anything else to, to mention other than I'm going to go eat some more of my cookies. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Mark, once again, thank you so much for being here. And as always guys know your industry and then I'll hit this button though. This button, I keep forgetting to have this lined up before we go. Here we go. Thanks guys for watching.